Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host Jivraj and today I have with me a very very interesting guest. Join me in welcoming Pratham Mittal who is the co-founder of Masters Union. Thank you so much Pratham for joining me. Very delighted to be hosting you. Glad to be here. Great. I think uh, I'm so excited primarily because as I was telling you hmm. it's very difficult to have people who can speak passionately and curiously about a variety of things and i think you are one of those well read well educated well experienced founders who can mostly do that uh, however for the benefit of the conversation i'd love to discuss more specific things and yeah. what you're doing with transforming higher education as i like to think about it right because i think you have this insane thesis about what's broken Mm -hmm. you also have insane action to back it and now be like this is the hypothesis with what you started and this is what's going to but i want to start off at an abstract note sure. right for the Love. benefit of the audience i think uh, <laughs> uh, two things that for me stand out about your experiences are one that you've put yourself in very different situations be yeah. it you know having born in um, jalandhar if i'm not wrong mm -hmm. then going to the doon school then studying in the us at u pen doing your undergrad uh, then starting a company then coming to india right all very diverse experiences yeah. and, and almost putting your foot down and saying that if somebody else can why can't i yeah. and you've proven that multifold now so if you can maybe talk about these two specific things mm. what they mean for you and maybe if you can start there that'll be awesome so the first is diversity of experience yes and second is if somebody else can why can't direct all right so let's start with the diversity of experience yeah. uh, so when i was in college in the us actually when i was in school in india in dehradun mm -hmm. at the doon school um, you know you could you could act in a play in the afternoon in the evening you could be playing a soccer game yeah. um, at night you could be swimming in a competition right in the next morning you would be doing a pt uh you know uh, with yeah. with one of the pt leaders so interestingly when i graduated doon school i realized that i hadn't made use of all the opportunities available to me mm -hmm. so even though i could have done all these four things mm -hmm. i in fact never acted in a play i in fact never learned how to play soccer mm -hmm. i never went to pt and you know built any muscle right yeah. so I, when i graduated doon school i graduated with a lot of regret Mm. I saw my friends who had made use of all the opportunities that they had mm. and I hadn't right so when I went to college in the US I went with this sort of thought that mere ko college ko nichodna hai yeah. like I want to get the last little thing that the college can give me and take everything out of it like I want to suck life out of college right and so right from my first semester in college mm -hmm. um I started acting in plays I started you know becoming part of random clubs like I I was even part of the gender studies club. Wow. Right. I was part of, I used to go to the LGBTQ center and hang out. Hmm. Right. I used to um I tried to learn a musical instrument, I tried to learn tabla. Right. Wow. All the things that I had missed in school, uh, I did it in college, right? right? And when I graduated college, I honestly had no regrets. Right? I was like there's nothing that I did not do. There was not yeah. a single person I did not know the name of. There's not a single um you know like dinner clubs as we used to call it that I wasn't part of, right? Yeah. I even joined a fraternity. Hmm. and i feel like you know uh, a lot of friends would tell me yeah you're not going deep into anything you're trying to cover lots of things but not going deep into anything and i'm like that's all right yeah that's okay like i'm in the us for 4 years at that time that was a plan <laughs> um you know let me just do everything mm. and and so i think it's it all of this came from this experience of having missed out in school right and then it became a habit over time mm. then it became a habit right you i always wanted to be part of the party or whatever fomo yeah. right yeah and so when i started up i wanted to be part of um you know i wanted to start up in first in tech right and then like you know blockchain came i wanted to do something in blockchain i was easily distracted mm -hmm. and that wasn't a good thing right in okay. the beginning i would try to do this also this also this also and i realized that you know if you really want to excel then you have to pick one thing and go really deep yeah. um so i think first phase of my life i did everything and then now i've become a little bit more measured in how i choose what to do fair enough um you also went ahead and won this prince uh, princeton hackathon yeah. right which kind of was a game changer because you almost mentioned on the record that you didn't expect to win yeah. uh, was that a turning point in your life did that i uh, kind of like define the fact that you can go ahead and do, do anything, anything with the yeah. smartest kids out there absolutely so i was at penn mm -hmm. and princeton is 2 hours away right. okay uh, penn is in philadelphia princeton is in jersey and and generally princeton is thought of as one of the top schools in the world and yeah. penn is like the second or third right like it's it's always been that way that and you know penn kids are almost insecure about this a little bit yeah and and so i went to princeton because princeton was hosting a startup weekend mm -hmm. and that weekend i was free 
And I was like, all right, let's do this Startup Weekend. Yes. And I, in fact, went in not knowing what Startup Weekend is. I actually went because one of my friends wanted to go. Okay. Right. And so I just went. Mm-hmm. Um, and there you have to build your own team. Uh, you have to pitch your idea to a bunch of people and try to sort of create a team around you. Yeah. Uh, and then you sort of work on that idea. Yeah. And then you pitch, right? And I said, all right, let me build a team. Nothing to lose, kind of a thing. So I built a team. Um, luckily, like five, six people joined that idea that I was interested in. And, and then we hacked up throughout the weekend. And in fact, our product didn't work, mm-hmm. right? It did not work at all. Uh, however, we created some HTML pages that sort of depicted the product working. Oh, and wow. we just attached <laughs> those HTML pages together. So you literally hacked in. So we literally <laughs> hacked it, right? Uh, we tried to code it a little bit, but nahi ho ra tha. that wasn't right. happening. So we like, oh, it might as well just uh, ma- you know, fake it till you make it sort of a thing. So we created that and we presented it mm-hmm. to the judges. And, and for a pen kit to win in Princeton was That's like a big, big deal. deal. <laughs> was like a big deal. Princeton was a college that rejected me. All right. right when I was <laughs> applying to colleges in the US. Yeah. So now it's like redemption time. So that yeah. gave me so much confidence. Uh, that right. that hey listen like you know if you just like throw in your hat there is a good chance you'll actually win also yeah right and so if you throw in your hat 10 times mm-hmm. even if you don't have merit even if you don't have skill even if you don't have uh, you know uh, the, the right skill sets etc you can still win just by chance yeah no that's that's true testament of it the other interesting part about this and you've spoken about this in the past that you know higher education in the US helps you design a life which is I mean, structure to interact with different people, mm. which does not happen as easily maybe in India, right? And so much of what you just mentioned is a factor of the experiences yeah. you had because there were such diverse people there. Mm. What according to you can one do to design a life centered around different experiences? Yeah. And how important is it, right? Because I mean, we tend to miss out most things because we're following a manual playbook that somebody else has designed for mm. us mm. and we don't have control. But when you're in the US, that manual playbook at actually has diversity in it. What do you think about so, that? So first of all, I don't think that's only US. Okay. You could achieve that same thing in India as well. Yes. It's more about the diversity of experience. It doesn't matter whether it's in the US or India. Fair. So that's number one. Um, I think I went to a good college in the US, hmm. right? I'm sure that if you go to an average college in the US, your experience would be just like an average college in India. Fair. Right. So that's that's at the outset, right? Um, I, I think... What you're alluding to is, is around meeting diverse set of people, being engaged in diverse set of activities, and, and just sort of learning diverse set of skills, maybe taking diverse set of classes, right? What all of these things do is that it helps you really understand how other people think, right? Mm. Um, it helps you empathize with the larger world. I used to be in this class, very interesting story. I used to be in this class called the African politics class, mm-hmm. okay? I had no idea about Africa before that. Um, and and I was in this African studies class where one of our professors was the the ex education minister of Ghana. Okay, wow. and he would you know give us stories about like you know how things used to happen in Ghana, all of that stuff, right? And he was giving this example of uh, Burundi and Rwanda, which actually used to be one country before, um, and it was divided. And the way it was divided was that there was a river, and they said that everything on the west bank would be Burundi, and I think on the right bank would be Rwanda. However, over, over after three, four years, mm-hmm. the river actually changed its course. Ooh. Okay. Oh, wow. And then there was this huge war. <laughs> right? <laughs> what is what? Yeah. So I learned about this. Mm-hmm. Right? I took classes, as I told you, in gender studies, right? right? Which sensitized me to like those topics. Now, every time I meet an, a, a person from Africa, from, you know, Rwanda, I just know where they're coming from. I just know what their life was all about. I took classes, let's say, in mechanical engineering. So I met, I meet a mechanical engineer. I know what his life yeah. might look like, right? So what this diversity of experience does is that it makes you relatable to a lot many more people. Yeah. And he says empathy? Empathy. Yeah. Empathy. And then once you have empathy, then you can have better relationships. Now, Absolutely. you're from Calcutta. Yeah. Right? Um, I, because of Dune School, I had two or three friends, very close friends of mine, were from Calcutta. Yeah. Right? And so they told me their stories of Calcutta. Yeah. They told me their stories of those bazaars and everything, right? And so every time you know, we meet, yeah. like there's a certain amount of familiarity that I have mm. with you, even though we've only just met. Yeah. Right? And that to me is empathy. That to me just makes deeper relationships. So the diversity of experiences 
makes brings you closer to people yeah does does that chain of thought make sense yeah yeah no i love it i think um, i think it goes it's not often mentioned how important diversity can be as they say we're a factor of the people we surround ourselves what not right it's said a lot but i don't think we design for it very consciously we just uh, yeah. we just rely on assumptions and uh, we we want to be in our comfort zone almost right yeah. and that's where familiarity to already experienced folks kind of like makes sense we want to hang around with our same friends but people who can and i think founders really go out of their way to surround themselves with all kinds of people and that's the kind of energy i radiate best with but i don't yeah. think i think that's a important I don't think anyone designs for it actually i think yeah. for me also it was serendipity it was by chance that these yeah. things happened right uh, but you, it's very hard and for colleges to design for this is it's incredibly all, hard all the more challenging yeah, I mean, but i'll be happy if colleges in india or even in the us just teach the curriculum properly <laughs> <laughs> no yeah that's for that's diverse, l1 yeah that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> diversity designing for diversity of experience is hard mm. however however there's certain one thing about colleges in the west is that they have a lot of international students yeah right and so that by default brings in diversity of exactly. experience because yeah. your roommate might be from ghana your yeah. assignment mate might be from rwanda you know it could be from anywhere yeah and so because of that you automatically have a diversity of experience exactly. in india most colleges uh barring the iits perhaps or the iims are localized correct right are localized so you only meet people from yeah, your own area similar so backgrounds it always remains in your comfort zone but yeah, i think that point is very important to iterate uh this has been interesting but let's go to another side of you now which is the founder side yeah. and before going to the masters union aspect uh, you built a company in the past yeah. which is outgrow yeah. uh and that was a very interesting non funded to founder person team right yeah. almost boot, bootstrap uh cash rich business you had revenue which is stable and you build that over a period of time uh you also come from a family of you know entrepreneurs Correct. you've seen business yeah. and, and of course Michael that's established is my, yeah. Yeah. yes it's in your name it's in your blood or uh, talk to us about how do you look at entrepreneurship what was that first stint like for you and, and how did that define your sort of founder persona so you know uh, my my father used to he started his career working in a sweet shop our family yeah. sweet shop yeah and uh, the sweet shop is called lovely sweets mm -hmm. and and my father would go there and he would sit behind the counter and he would actually cut bills yeah. right cutting bills and i used to love it right because he would receive money and he would take write the bill and then he would you know <laughs> yeah so that to me was my first stint in entrepreneurship right and so on sundays i was allowed to sit behind the counter and do that same thing mm -hmm. right and so you know like how you count cash like i'm really good at that like i can do that very quickly uh so so that experience was i think my first stint with entrepreneurship because i remember like some customers would come and you know try to haggle or some customers would come and try to sort of like say nahi nah, aapki ye mithai kharab nikli yeah. and then you have to convince them otherwise right and so as i, I was maybe like 5 6 7 years old when i started doing that mm -hmm. um thereafter my dad started a different business in automobiles where he was selling cars Hmm. he got a dealership of bajaj and maruti mm -hmm. right and then i would go there and i would see how the sales people would be selling the cars and how on weekends on saturdays dad would take a sales meeting where yeah. he would call all the sales people and then sales person by sales person you know everyone would talk about what their target was and how much they achieved and then the rest of the team would clap or whatever right and there would be that sales appreciation event yeah that to me i think was my second uh, stint with entrepreneurship right and i remember one time i got to read out the you know the sales targets and everything so so i think in family business settings you get exposed to entrepreneurship very early on yeah. so for me there was never any other career path wow. like i didn't sit for placements i didn't yeah. so there's a very interesting story actually so i actually interned at a different company it okay. was a it was a small studio um like a venture studio in new york mm -hmm. um and i was it was called trigger media and they used to incubate media companies Uh, uh daily candy etc were some of the companies that incubated at that time and and i started working there and i'm not kidding within 2 weeks within 2 yeah. weeks i <laughs> basically got fired oh wow because what i would do is in the in the lunch time um i would just go close by there was this, this place called general assembly mm. right and they used to host these meetups entrepreneurship meetups and like some speaker would be coming all the time and i would go there for like lunch so that i could hear listen to somebody but i would end up staying a little bit over right yeah. so i always got late coming back from lunch mm -hmm. and then the founder called me and he's like dude listen this is not going to work and he basically like threatened to fire me he basically fired me and then i said <laughs> no 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 please like my visa otherwise i can't stay in the us whatever <laughs> um 
Yeah, so I think it's just like, and even today, right, when we go back home, yeah. um, I feel like it's not that you switch off work and you switch on home. Yeah. For us, work and home is like very intertwined. intertwined. We yeah. go back home, we sit on the dinner table and we talk about work. Yeah. Right. And very different conversations, not the funding, not the growth. Ah, no, no, it's all that. <laughs> hey, yeah, it's all that. It's all that. And then in the morning you wake up, yeah. and the first thing you see is your phone, and then like you start <laughs> applying to emails, and then you're. So yeah. it's, 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 it's just, I think, a way of life. It's like yeah. you have religion. Mm-hmm. I think, like, in, in, in our community, business is the religion. Absolutely. Oh, that's lovely. Uh, coming to the other side now, now with Masters Union, before we get into what you're doing, you have this very interesting thesis about how education is broken, right? Yeah. Uh, and there's this, of course, famous deal, and you've spoken about this in the past, that the way of education delivery, the modes have changed. Uh, there's a lot of tech in it, but the way has not fundamentally yeah. changed, right? A- and a lot of that is something that you're trying to champion. Uh, two questions there. One is I want to understand if this is a problem that's lying in plain sight, then why is not why is something not being done proactively on a larger scale about it, right? Why are you the one talking about yeah. it and not everybody else, yeah. right? That's one. Second is... It's a very, huh? it's a very controversial <laughs> question. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, but I'd love to know your thoughts yeah. because it almost feels like there needs to be more of a conversation yeah. around it, right? But nobody's talking about it. Everybody's yeah. just okay with status quo. Yeah. Nobody's objecting to it. Everybody's like, let's be as it is. Uh, and the second is with this depth of a thesis, right? How do you think this eventually becomes a ripple effect? Yeah. So it, it's Got an it. extension of the first question. Okay. But what do you think about that? Okay. It's a very good question, yeah. Very deep. So um, let's start with this. Education has not changed in 2000 years, right? Yeah. I've said this before thousands of times. And the reason it has not changed in 2000 years uh, is because in most of the world, education does not invite the education industry does not invite entrepreneurs Hmm. okay the reason for that is education industry in most countries is not for profit okay right right so if i am an innovative entrepreneur why would i want to build an organization that's not for profit there would be some people there would be some people who are motivated to build a not-for-profit you have salman khan yeah uh the founder of khan academy Mm -hmm. but by and large because the industry is not for profit it does not invite, it is not very lucrative to high achieving ambitious entrepreneurs. Right. Okay. That's Fair. the basic, basic reason, right? Number one. Number two, the people who run educational institutions are people who are products of the same educational institutions. So an IIT professor today was an IIT student some time back. Hmm. Right. And he was taught by an IIT professor who was an IIT student sometime back. <laughs> yeah. So there is that vicious circle going on, which does not invite outside perspective to come in. And if you do not bring in outside perspective, if mm-hmm. you do not bring in original out of the box people or thoughts or perspectives, the business will just not innovate. Mm-hmm. My father says something very interesting. Yeah. A professor came to him and said, you know, uh, Mr. Mittal, I have 25 years of experience teaching. My father says, no. You have one year of experience, 25 times over. Wow, that's deep. Right? And yeah. that explains the problem with education. Yeah. You do not have 25 years of experience. You have one year of experience repeated 25 times. Yeah. Right? And so these are some of the reasons because of which education has not innovated. Because it's not for profit. Because the people running it are people of the same, hmm. the product of the same system. Uh, the other thing, and this is very, very sad, is that people who choose to teach, uh, for whatever reason, choose this career path because it's seemingly safe and secure. Yeah. It's not because of the passion of it. It's almost like a... Yeah, some people are driven by the passion of it. Yeah, but I a think, low proportion. I think I think that would be 10%. Yeah. I think 90% of people who end up teaching are teaching for the wrong reasons. Mm. Right? They're not teaching for the love of teaching. They're teaching because yeah. it's a safe job. Yeah. Which it is. Yeah. Which it is, right? Uh, and that goes back to it being a not-for-profit, right? Yeah. All of those things. So, uh, have you ever heard of a university or college laying off stuff? It just doesn't yeah. happen, right? Right. Uh, so, so, I think 
to break this vicious circle uh, of there being no innovation in education we are still teaching the same way aristotle or plato taught 2000 years ago i think we need to bring in outside perspective we need to bring in people who are not from the education industry to come into the education industry yeah and that's where sort of masters union idea came about right mm -hmm. can we bring in practitioners from the industry to come in and teach then they will teach differently because yeah. they are used to innovation if you bring in founders to come into the campus they'll obviously challenge the status quo of education as well right i also come from a saas background right a hardcore software background and so i bring all of those learnings and all of those sort of breaking the status quo while energy into education absolutely that has just not happened and so the reason we are able to do this is because we are not for we are a for profit company yeah right and so the only disadvantage i have is that i cannot give a degree hmm right so up until now people have not come into education for profit because they could not give degrees but guess what today big degrees are becoming less relevant yeah right so i can start an education institution masters or even undergrad yeah um even if there's no degree because hey you know what my students are getting placed the industry is inviting them with open arms so if the industry is accrediting me i don't care if the ugc aict all of these organizations do not accredit me yeah right and so the ripple effect that you spoke about gets created that if i do well if masters union does well both yeah. financially and on b school rankings yeah. then other b schools would be like hey listen we can also yeah. do this yeah you need that one champion for the others to follow right and this becomes an example poster this becomes an example and financially if it does well then it invites other entrepreneurs to come in and try this yeah and on the rankings it does well it invites other b schools existing ones that are too caught up in the status quo to rethink their process rethink their, yeah. if not anything else exactly. yeah and that's brilliant i think uh, that's a lot of food for thought and i think uh, a lot of people need to proactively just put their mind into questioning the basics in education because i think again the problem of we just think of it as a process that's there for the adage and we not we don't really challenge it but i think what you're doing is brilliant and coming to that right i think before we talk further about masters union if you can just give us a precursor for all that's happening right now because i've had the pleasure of being to campus and i've really enjoyed all my interactions be it with you the team the students yeah. in some shape or form the faculty the students uh, love you yeah <laughs> and i'm so glad but uh, i think it's a very very interesting concept uh, in the sense that on paper we all know that it exists mm -hmm. but in practicality it's not really happened especially mm -hmm. not that i know of uh, but what you're trying to do is very very interesting so maybe talk to us just about uh, the what the what is happening part of it and then we'll go into depths of it specifically about masters union yes. okay so it's it's very simple yeah and um, it's just two things actually first is that we are trying to bring in practitioners to come and teach right mm -hmm. that was the thesis and what is happening is that because we are in gurgaon because most of the companies are set up here in fact in the same building that we are sitting in right now a lot of these practitioners can just walk over and teach so it's very easy for them to teach yeah right so that's happening today and it's happening beautifully um the second thing is that uh we challenged ourselves to think about a classroom beyond slides exams lectures whiteboards all of that yeah. right so in our classrooms we have none of that right or we try to reduce that as much as possible yeah. there are certain courses you have to teach in a in a fundamental way but uh but mostly we push our teachers our practitioners to come and teach in a hands on way right mm. and what does hands on mean uh i can give a few examples uh to learn accounting either you can sit and sort of you know draw those lines and you know create that credit debit balance right, right. but the problem with that is that you don't see how that would be helpful to you later in life correct that's why most students basically like doze off in an accounting class They're like mai kyun kar raha hu credit debit kya fayda hona iska mere ko what we try to do is we say hey listen here's a small shopkeeper who runs a kirana ki dukan right why don't you go there and audit his books right and now suddenly you've changed the game completely yeah right now the student wants to help the kirana ki dukan and you change the game even further by saying whoever gets the best review from the owner the business, yeah from the business they get the best grade right you have changed the game and i think that makes teaching very hands on that makes learning very hands on you know you've seen that pyramid right that when you read something you register it 10% if you see some if you hear something you register it 20% if you see something you register it 40% that's where our classes stop today 
hear, mm. hearing, seeing, reading, right? Yeah. So that means you've only achieved 40%. Yeah. Now to achieve that, the next 60%, you, do you have to experience it. Yes. You have to live it. You have to right? do it. And so that's why people say, you know, I learned most of my skills on the job. Mm. Because you're actually applying what you're learning hey. in the job. And so that's what we're doing at Master's Union, essentially, right? Can we create this on-the-job experience day-to-day -day in the classroom? Yes, and no, that's brilliant. I can testify for it. That begs the question, though, that, you know, when you're trying to do something which is radically different, because when you hear of it, uh, if I had to compare this to a yep. general B-school setting, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to classes with renowned professors and alums, you're now building an experience where you have, you know, a lot of hands-on experience, no classes, yep. and with people who may not have traditional teaching as an experience, right? So you're trying to do this. I understand why now it's making sense. Talk to us about that first cohort, right? When you were trying to do this, like what was the, I understand why you had belief, but how did you instill belief in the people around you? How do you attract the first set of, first cohort? Like why, how, why did that, those 60 people join? See, if you're trying to innovate, right? Yeah. You can't innovate the entire thing. Fair. There has to be certain level of familiarity. Hmm. Otherwise, people will not steps. buy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people will not buy into your idea. Yeah. If you say, "Hey, listen, you know, stop drinking uh, Coke today and start drinking sparkling water. Sparkling water <laughs> today only. Abhi. Yeah. People will not do it. Mm -hmm. You will say, you know what? Drink Coke two days a week yeah. and then reduce it. Dheere dheere. Yeah. Right. You have to sort of let it burn on the simmer. Dheere dheere. So, in our first year. We did not say any of these things. Okay. Okay. In the first year, we did not say we're going to change education. In the first year, we did not say we are going to have like no exams, no lectures, no, none of this. We did not say that you only want to have practitioners come and teach. We did not say any of that. We said, hey, listen, it's going to be a PGP. Even today, it's a PGP, mm -hmm. which is something that people are familiar with. Yes. You're going to have a campus, which is something people are familiar with. You're going to have classrooms mm -hmm. because people expect to see that in a, in a campus. Yeah. However, 50% of all courses would be co-taught by practitioners, hmm. right? If I had said year one, you know, no classrooms, no nothing, people would be like, yeah, father, yeah. Okay. I love that. I think right. that's a very interesting way to look at it because you, if you're doing something radically different, you can't just shock the consumer. You can't shock. Yeah. You, you have will to get so much mistrust. Correct. You have to lay the pieces. That's a very good way to think about it. So in the yeah. first year, maybe the innovation was only 15%, 20%. Hmm. Then 30%. Then 40. Today also I'm only at 40, 50%. Yeah. There's a lot more to cover. How do you ground. stay patient? It's strategy, right? Hmm. I think it's a strategy. I, I read this uh, in some article. I'm forgetting what article this was. That you know there has to be certain amount of familiarity in every innovation. Hmm. Otherwise, people will get too scared. Yeah. Right. So in the very beginning, we said, hey, listen, you know, we are going to lay out our carpet. Dheere dheere. Otherwise, it will get too much for people to, uh, to absorb. absorb. And yeah. especially education is something that you're only going to purchase once or maybe twice in your life. It is that item that you perhaps spend the most in your life for other right. than buying a home or a car. Yeah. Sometimes more expensive than a car. We are more expensive yeah. than any car. <laughs> yeah. Right. So people really think about where they go to school, where Absolutely. they go to college, right? Yeah. Like how many times have you discussed this with your parents? Your parents have discussed with their friends. Ko bhejna hai, ye wo. Correct. You don't think about purchasing anything else this much. Absolutely. So that's why we have to be very sensitive about mm -hmm. how we are pitching. So in our first year, it was just about, hey, some practitioners will come and teach. Yeah. In year two, it became, you know what? All classes practitioners will come and teach. Yeah. Okay, people are like, okay. By that time, our placement report was out. So there was some trust. Yeah. And now the third year, we are coming and saying, hey, listen, you know what? throw away the classroom. Mm. We're going to do everything hands on. Yeah. Right. And now people are like, okay, interesting. Okay. What's, what's next? What's next? Yeah. Right. And so in the very first year, I did not start undergrad. Yeah. We started with masters because we know that our early adopter audience would be a master's audience because undergrad audience is still a little bit more sensitive to all of these things. Yeah. Right. Parents will not be able to yeah. venture. It's a larger commitment also. Larger four, years. four year commitment. Yeah. Parents uh, make the decisions rather than the students. And parents are usually not early adopters because they're very <laughs> protective of their kids. Yeah. So we're only starting undergrad in our fourth year. Yeah. Right. And, and now people have warmed up to us. And now I can say, hey, listen, you know what? Undergrad be here. Yeah. Now we're going to talk more about that. But I love this point around patience as a strategy because I feel so, so many people talk about the fact that it's eventually founders who come in their own way when they're trying to scale. Mm. And if you're patient, if you're not patient, that can be a deterrent. But I think what you mentioned about just being 
very strategic about this innovation cycle is very cool uh, the other design can challenge I, can, I, can I challenge you on that a little bit tell me sorry so uh, just a thought experiment right Please. I, I feel like I feel like founders come in their own way when it's a venture funded company yeah fair L- enough right like, I've seen I've, I've seen companies being built in the venture funded way mm-hmm. I've worked uh, very closely with some of the founders yeah um and i have also seen companies built in the traditional way bootstrap way and i've i've built one myself and i feel like you know when you're building sustainably when you're building for profit when you're building bootstrapped then every action that you take every expense you think about it five times hmm. six times because you don't have you don't have luxury you don't have the luxury you yeah. can't go wrong because you don't have money to go wrong fair but when you are venture funded hmm. i'm not talking about everybody here i'm talking about that 5 10 20 percent of founders who do come in their own way yeah i think in their pursuit to hyper scale mm-hmm. they come in their own way yeah or when they're hyper scaling their egos come in their own way right so and you know what what percentage of companies are venture funded Le- not even 1% yeah right so i think in our media we talk more about venture funded venture companies. funded companies so we try yeah. to generalize this founders coming in their own way kind of thing hmm. but i think in a sustainable in, in like an old economy business yeah i don't think that happens actually i think yeah. founders are very measured i think founders are very responsible i agree i think uh, the more important one i was trying to make is the fact that when you are scaling the 5% 10% companies that are unable to scale effectively it's the you know 1% gap of not not getting out of your own way hiring the best people like things like oh, those like things that. Like, yep, sure. yeah i think those yeah. are different That's but i completely agree i mean being venture backed just misaligns objectives yeah. and then you have to do things that you may not want to do mm-hmm. and which is with what you have to be comfortable with as a venture funded founder and when you're not i think this happens Correct. so and and from the investor's perspective is totally fine if a few founders come in their way because they are hyperscaling and they are yeah. investing for hyperscale Yeah, yeah. So 10 mein se 9 band ho jaye koi tension nahi hai. Correct. That was part of the business plan. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's another debate because I think investor founder uh, you know incentives are very misaligned. Oh, In, yeah. Investors like like gain even if nine companies fail and one succeeds, okay. but I think uh, when the nine companies fail, those nine company employees, the founders, their families, there's such a ripple effect. Mm-hmm. I think that's for another time. Yeah, yeah. But um, the the other important challenge in my opinion and i've been thinking about this since i came and i don't think i've had a chance to address it out loud is that education by definition has these defined outcomes by which you are evaluated in your case it is placements right mm-hmm. which is why the emphasis on it as well however i feel that it's so difficult to guarantee or rather you know assure a certain sense of placement style that it moves you in different ways because you have to address placements and eventually have that as an outcome since that's your not star and not experience can you tend to not follow what's in your heart and do things because the eventual goal is placements i mean just sure. as a design problem great how question. do you address it great question so i think the way we approach placements is very different here at masters union right So generally if you look at a business school and I'm this is true for you know Wharton Harvard Stanford everybody mm-hmm. is that I know that I want to get into Bain I don't want to get into Microsoft I know I want to get into Google so all my classes all my projects everything would be geared towards that exactly right because placements start very early in the process yeah you've just started and you start thinking about you know where I'm going to get placed summer internships will start within 6 months Correct. all of that yeah so here what we are trying to push our kids into doing so our placement strategy is that we force everybody as you know to build a company in each term yeah to have that zero to one journey in each term so in term one students build e-commerce drop shipping websites in term two students build a youtube page and they try to monetize it in term three they build layer two blockchain protocols in term four cloud kitchen term five whatever xyz now as they have these experiences of building companies they become very good at that zero to one journey they become experts uh, you know in teams of 5 they usually do these companies and one would become an expert in managing finances one would yeah. become an expert in managing digital marketing one would become an expert in leadership bringing everyone together and as you build these skills placements automatically solve for themselves right mm. so let me give you some data examples right so last year 
one of our students, he started this company called Zood for Food as part of one of his projects. Okay. Okay. Which was basically helping um, uh, people when they're trying to sort of order on Zomato, it takes them a lot of time to figure out what to order on Zomato. Yeah. So it was an AI that would recommend to you what to order. Brilliant. Right. <laughs> and then once you decide what to order, it'll send you to Zomato, to that same specific place, whatever. It's a very simple product, great idea. Right. And uh, obviously it didn't work out for whatever okay. reasons, right? It didn't work out. However, that same person is currently a chief of staff at Aether. Wow. Right. And his entire Aether interview was about his experience running Zood for food. Right? Yeah. Once you've been a founder. Yeah, you can crack it. You can crack any job. Yeah. I agree. Right. Once you've been a founder, you've been in that mindset. Right. Yeah. First of all, other founders will see that and hire you. Yeah. Number two, you just become this person who has relentless energy, who has this sense of not giving up, right? This sense of, yeah. right? You get the, the, the thing I want to, you know, I, I talk to my team about is the founder's ego. The founder's ego is actually very large. Yeah. Ki nahi kar paya. Right? yeah. And so to satisfy his own <laughs> ego, he'll make sure he cracks that, right? He gets that mindset of, first of all, a growth mindset, but also problem solving mindset. Right. And that is very easily, easily noticeable in an interview. Mm. So that's how we solve for placements. Ki make everyone a founder. Yeah. Make every student a founder. Placements will crack themselves. That's yeah. our very straightforward system here at Masters Union. Like, yeah. and I'm laying it out open for anyone <laughs> to, you know, if you're looking for a job, start a company, you will get a job. Yeah. Now, that's interesting, but I think that's still, I mean, I, I'd like to think that through this process, I understand why that makes sense in practicality but through the process is there a sense of uh, uncertainty to whether or not you'll get placed because you're not following that traditional method because i mean what's the certainty right it's almost like i'm going on an experiment uh, which might lead to a job but i'm not sure and since there's no definition for it before no that's where data comes in we okay. have two graduate two cohorts that have graduated and now you can prove it and now we can prove it right last mm. year uh, we had amazing placements this year. I mean, yeah, yeah. a couple of weeks ago, we released our placement report. Yeah, phenomenal. And I can very honestly and through data tell you that almost 30 to 40% of all placements that happened happened because the students had founded a company, right? Yeah. And if I were to put my students into two categories, those who had seriously founded a company and those who hadn't, and if I had to compare their average CTCs, the mm. difference of at least 30, 40% in favor of the ones who had started the company. <laughs> yeah. Right. And course. also in terms of the kind of roles you get, right? The people who had started companies, mm -hmm. they're very easily able to grab chief of staff, founders office, product management, these sort yeah. of roles. Yeah. It just comes to them naturally. Currently, and this is a very, this is my favorite story. One of my students, he cracked a founder's office role at Zerodha. Yeah. Right. And Zerodha, at Zerodha, Nitin Kamath, who's a founder, has publicly proclaimed on one of these podcasts, <laughs> that we do not hire from MBA colleges. Yeah. In fact, he's also said that they don't have any <laughs> MBA yeah. in their team at yeah. Zerodha. Yeah. And they took an MBA as from their Master's founder's Union. office. Yes. From Master's Union. And that was because Dipankar, who's a student, had actually started a company called, um, called uh, I'll, I'll just come to me. <laughs> but what the company did was, it was a real money game uh, on top of quizzing. Right. So you oh, win a quiz yeah. and you win money. Right. And, uh, I feel like if enough students did that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, enough students did do that and now have data to prove. And so now with my third cohort, fourth cohort, I can very convincingly tell them, Hey guys, just do this is the formula. Yeah. And oh, that's brilliant. I think, yeah, that, that goes to show that there's method to the madness yeah. and then you can prove it with data as well, yeah. uh, which is super cool. No, but I think I have been a huge fan of all that's happening here. And uh, the other part about making it happen is the broader team, right? And it goes to the point that when you're trying to do something disruptive, it's very difficult to follow suitors who really believe in the mission or can actually believe in executing it rather, right? I think most people will say that this sounds intuitive, we'd love to do it, but the method is, I'm sure, very, very experimental in nature for the lack of a better word. Uh, talk to us about how you're going about building this team that goes yeah. behind you know, doing some of these things, designing the programs, designing the activities, because this is a lot of unstructured learning yep. built into one in a structure which yep. can actually prove outcomes. So I'll tell you what not to do, right? 
don't hire from other educational institutions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'd be my guess. <laughs> yeah, that was the first thing, right? We did not recruit from other IMs or other ISB or some you know, colleges, right? Yeah. Because had we done that, hmm. then you would have become just like them. Absolutely. So we made it very clear that, you know, while we can hire their students, let's not hire people who currently work there, hmm. right? Um, unless, unless you are unhappy about that <laughs> system, right? In which case, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Uh, so we have stayed clear of recruiting from our competitors. Hmm. We have tried to bring in people from other industries. Um, we have tried to bring in people who uh, sort of themselves never were big champions of the education system, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I love people who say, oh, you know, my undergrad or my PG experience was just very shitty. Yeah. And I want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So that would be the common theme that you'll find, yeah. you know, amongst the leadership team here. That's number one. Number two is that you have to go search for people if you are only recruiting from the incoming leads, mm -hmm. that's never going to build you a A plus okay. team. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. My most high impact hires have been people who I found Chased. on LinkedIn or whatever. Yeah. And then I went after them. Yeah. Right. And I convinced them to please leave whatever they were doing and join me. <laughs> Is there an interesting story that I there can There are share? lots of interesting stories. So I'll tell you one. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's... Uh, uh, you know, one of the, he is the highest impact team member that we have. Uh, he, in fact, came to us and he was uh, leading sales at Nokri. He was leading one of the, the regions mm -hmm. there. And he came to us to sell Nokri.com. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when he was selling to us, he did a really good job. So I had told him that, hey, listen, you know, Nokri.com is not very good for uh, recruiting professors and we need to recruit professors. Yeah. Right. And I just wanted to, you know, say Test no. Like I just wanted to say no <laughs> to him. And I said, you know, obviously Nokri.com is for corporates and not for universities. So just please go. Mm -hmm. So he left. The next day he comes back and he said, you know what? I did the entire search of the entire database of Nokri and I found these professors. You had said you will not be able to find professors. You know what? I found these professors. Mm. And that was incredible hustle. Yeah. And since then, since that time, I was after him. Join my team, join my team, join my team. There's another nice. person mm -hmm. who was trying to pitch something to us. And, and, you know, we were just not able to give him time, right? Mm. Uh, and he figured out that I was going to be taking a flight from Chandigarh. Uh. And I was in Jalandhar at the time. And he said, hey, listen, you're going to be on this, on this, on this, on this car ride. Mm -hmm. And in this car ride, there's very bad internet connectivity through that journey. Mm -hmm. So can I just come with you and we can talk on the way? Wow. How do you say no to that? <laughs> yeah what can you say right it was right. bang in the afternoon you can't say i have to sleep or whatever i was like sure come man why not and he sold me the product in the car and i wouldn't have bought it actually because mm -hmm. the product wasn't very useful to me but his hustle was so convincing yeah i said you cannot you, you have to join me right mm -hmm. um i have lots of other stories there's one uh, very high impact person we have in our team she used to run a company before this right she she had raised some 10 15 million dollars for a company and from like top VCs. Mm -hmm. uh, however, she had to shut it down, you know, post COVID things sort of changed obviously for the ad tech industry. She was in the ad tech industry, but she actually returned the money to the investors. No wow. one ever does that. Yeah. No one ever does that. People yeah. like burn till they die, right? They realized very early on that, you know, their business model is not going to mature or sustain beyond a certain scale. Mm -hmm. So they went to the investors and returned the money. Just think about that integrity. Yeah. It speaks volumes of the person. Right. I read about this story on LinkedIn. We figured mm -hmm. out who the founder was, messaged the founder on LinkedIn, and I knew that she'd be getting like, you know, multiple, multiple offers. offers. So I said, let's close. Like, I think I sent her her message on Friday. I met her on Saturday, closed on Sunday. Like, uh, it had to be that quick because I knew yeah. otherwise she'd get uh, yeah, it'd be gone. somewhere else, right? Love that. So I think recruiting is something that founders should spend 30% of their time on. Yeah. Oh, I think that's lovely. Goes to show, I mean, that you really have to be hungry to hire talent better than you, as they say, right? Like there's often this adage that's used. It was very difficult to imagine that. I think those stories really prove it. Uh, to the first point that you were mentioning, very quickly double-clicking on it, right? I've seen a lot of founders just go ahead and disrupt industries that they don't come from. Yeah. Uh, like we were talking to Harsh of Pristine Care, no healthcare no background. Healthcare. And building pristine, right? Um, the founder of Zumato does not have a yeah. food tech, restaurant tech background, whatnot, right? Uh, so we've seen these examples, and you went ahead and said something similar, right? Get outsiders 
talk to us about what that really means like i i know the beginners mindset and all of those fancy terms that you put it but how does that actionably help you even in teams right i seen founders do that themselves but in teams also is like very interesting to see yeah I think uh, with founders, I think it's just about being, you know, centered, right? Which you yeah. said, the beginner's mindset. Yeah. Uh, they think everything is possible. Yeah. But your question is more about the team. Yeah. I think, so I'll tell you a story. Um, one of my team, very high impact person, he comes from, uh, he comes from uh, uh, this hardcore ed tech background, right? Uh, and, and he brings this systems mindset to a physical education institution, right? So he mm. thinks in terms of scale, he thinks in terms of automation, He because he's been trying to figure out systems for tens of thousands of students at his yeah. previous company, yeah. right? Here we only have, you know, a limited set of students, yeah. right? Uh, but he is always thinking of scale, right? He's always thinking of systems, he's always thinking of uh, how can I reduce the amount of workload mm. that uh, each person is doing, right? Mm. Uh, so now he's bringing that mindset to our organization and that to me is super useful because had it not been for him I would have kept throwing people at problems hmm. because what we are running here is a services company yes right and in services companies you throw more people, people <laughs> yeah. right? but he comes from a product background hmm. and so he's tried to productize the entire college experience yeah. right he thinks in terms of playbooks hmm which I could not have done here because I come from this industry, yeah. right? So that's a very interesting example. Uh, another one, which is placements, mm -hmm. right? So usually the way we do placements in any, in any college is that you have day zero, day one, you know, all of that yeah. stuff, right? And you know, in our very first year we did do that. Mm -hmm. And it, it was okay for us, it worked out. It worked. But when someone else started sort of uh, heading placements for us other than me, <laughs> she comes from a very different background, right? She comes from a sales background. So she, she started doing placements like she's selling each student to a company, right? So she very packaged cool. the student like a product, right? And that product had a very nice <laughs> wrapper on it and a ribbon yeah. on top. <laughs> yeah. And that's how she's doing placements. Very different from how other business schools are doing placements. Mm. She literally wraps every student in a nice box, Yeah. right? Uh, you know, put some perfume on it, whatever. I don't know what she does, <laughs> but, but she's able to completely transform a placements system. Hmm. So what, I think this diversity of perspective, experience in your yeah. team, they really are able helps. to bring in experiences or systems that work in other industries to your industry. I think that's how innovation happens, right? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more and I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's, let's shift gears again and maybe address the elephant in the room. And for me, that is the undergrad, right? Yeah. Now you're coming up with a four-year program for undergraduation at Masters Union. Uh, a couple of very quick thoughts there, right? And I'll tell you the outside yeah. perspective so that maybe we can get yeah. thoughts from you as to how you're designing it. But at the very onset, it feels like it's a four-year commitment, no degree, how will this run, right? Like how do we go ahead and put our faith into it, right? As a consumer, I'm speaking. But at the same time, I also want I also know that you know people my age are thinking experiential. They really want an experience beyond what the usual top colleges do, right? How do you bridge this gap of trust while maintaining the difference in quality that you want to serve and maybe marry the two in the best possible yeah. way? So um, we realize that if you want to do undergrad, we cannot say no to degrees. Okay. So okay. there are degrees. So there are degrees actually. Okay. So we work with Delhi University. And Amazing. each of our undergraduate students will actually get a Delhi University degree. Awesome. Right? And Delhi University was very forthcoming in helping us do this. Right? Brilliant. Um, this goes back to that familiarity concept. Yeah. Right? The undergrad market, you cannot tell them today, hey, listen, no degrees. Yeah. They will not accept it. <laughs> exactly. Right? So we are not doing it at least this year, or at least for the next four or five years. Students will get degrees. Awesome. Later on, if our program does well, and if the students get selected in the industry, and if they're highly valued, then maybe I can say no to degrees, okay. right? But this is not the time for it. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, you have to balance, right? You have to balance. So uh, we realize that the word semester is something that still brings uh, a lot of trust in people, right? Okay, it's yeah. a semester system. Yeah. A lot of people ask us, okay, is it annual or is it semester? whatever. And in the beginning, we had thought of having quarters. Mm. Yeah. 
And then my team very quickly realized that, hey, listen, if we do quarters, people will get scared. Oh, will there be exams every quarter? And, you know, will the stress yeah. on my child will be too much? So yeah. we decided to go back to semesters. <laughs> Right. Interesting. So while you innovate, hmm. don't innovate too much. Too also, much. right? Goes back keep to that, that balance. Keep that balance. Um, so what you know, uh, what we wanted to do was you know try to do this zero to one, build a business kind of a thing, right? Um, and we realized that not all students in undergrad might want to build a business. A lot of them might want to join a company. Exactly. Right. Might yeah. want to, you know, sit for an MBA later on, right? Yeah. So we had to sort of reorient ourselves, change mm-hmm. the product a little bit from the PGP pr- product. Uh, and make sure it suits the undergrad audience as well. So we had to make a lot of adjustments to mm-hmm. the undergrad program to make it easy to digest for the yeah. overprotective parent today. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll see, sort of, we'll also learn. Maybe this, <laughs> maybe this does well, maybe it doesn't, right? Yeah. So the jury's still out on that. Yeah. What are you most excited about when this program launches? Um, it's, you know, whenever you start a business, you always think about that, you know, this is the persona that I will attract. Hmm. and you create your product, your marketing around that persona. Yeah. Right? We do that in product management, develop hmm. personas. Every founder has probably done this. <laughs> yeah. right? In my experience, and even if founders don't sort of agree to this uh, or you know, uh, agree <laughs> to this to public, yeah. more often than not, that persona that you actually end up attracting is very different. Hmm. Yeah. Right? So uh, very early on, I thought that you know, Masters Union would not be able to attract the cat audience. Hmm. Because that cat audience wants IMs. Because that cat audience wants structure. That cat audience wants, you know, that safe job. Reliability. Reliability, right? Yeah. But I was super surprised that in the very first year, almost 70% of all the applicants were cat applicants. So I was proven completely wrong. Yeah. Someone I... in my team actually told me that, that, you know, that you should also target cat audiences. And then, so every year I'm surprised by the kind of persona that comes in. Mm. So for undergrad, I'm super excited to see who are the kind of people mm. who are able to become our early adopters. Yeah. Will it be the people who do you know really well in JE? Yeah, the IIT aspirants. The IIT aspirants. Would it be the Delhi University folks? Yeah. Will Would it be, it be tier school? two, tier three folks? Tier two, two Dune school folks. Yeah. Would it be international students? Yeah. Would it be kids who are over enthusiastic to start their companies? Would it be kids who live in Delhi? I, I have no idea. Yeah. I have a persona in mind. Mm-hmm. But I know for a fact I'll be wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, that's very interesting to know. Uh, waiting to be surprised if I had yeah, to summarize. Yeah, waiting to be surprised. And then the thing is like, you know, when you're running a product company, you're selling a service. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, you don't really see your customers that much. You maybe mm-hmm. talk to them over customer support. Yeah. In our case, the customer lives in our home. <laughs> yeah. You're interacting with them day in, day out. Over a year, over four years. Yeah. Right. Such a strong feedback cycle. Such a strong feedback cycle. And you see them grow yeah in master's union the biggest gratification that i have every day is when i see that the student has learned a lesson and has sort of grown from what the student looked like yesterday yeah right? i've seen people who come in at six lakhs of salary and they graduate at 33 lakhs of salary i've seen yeah. people who are not able to speak a word coherently yeah give speeches confidently yeah. i've seen people who had no idea of what tam sam saw means <laughs> yeah right? and then like two months later, they're quoting as if like, you know, they were born with that knowledge. Yeah. I've seen people who had no idea about how to do a pitch, hmm. right? People who actually, now they are taking classes for their next cohort, training them yeah. how to pitch, right? That gratification, seeing is somebody immense. grow is, is above any kind of gratification. Yeah. Right. And so in undergrad, I feel like we'll be able to make even more of an impact. Yeah. Cycles longer, you'll be able to see massive growth massive in growth right and if we yeah. can achieve that delta see the problem is that in iits or in iams you get a student who's a 9 on 10 yeah and you might make him a 9 on 9.2 on 10 yeah right i'm sorry but iit did nothing for that that person would have become a 9.2 9.5 irrespective of whether he came to iit or not i yeah. strongly believe that yeah, yeah can you take a student at 7 on 10 and make him a 9.5 on 10. Can you take a student 2 on 10 and make him a 9.5 on 10? Yeah. That is true gratification and that is true validation of, of your business. So Masters Union, we have been the underdog, yeah. right? So we have not always had sort of, at least in our very first couple of years, the best of the best students, mm-hmm. right? We did not have the toppers early on because the toppers went to IAMs, right? Yeah. Um, Today is a different story because, you know, we have been established, but back then it was the case. So we proved our pedagogy we proved our education 
working with students who were mid to up tier rather than the top most mm-hmm. tier yeah and then we were able to bring them at the level of the top most tier and that was the gratification so in education you know you change people's lives yeah right? and, and and i think like that's something i'm super excited for as we start undergrad i can only imagine because i mean as you said the gratification just from the outside seems so immense looking at somebody growing over 12 16 months once uh, what happened at the graduation ceremony this year mm-hmm. a parent came up to me i'm not kidding she started crying to me wow she she wailed and wailed and she's like you changed my son's life you brought him back on track you you know you you know essentially like she was giving me i mean i was super discomfort uncomfortable about this she was giving me god status almost yeah right and i was like no no auntie maine to aisa kya hai he worked hard he aise aise but i realized what like masters you didn't mentor that parent yeah it can create no other product can create that absolutely maybe shaadi.com can <laughs> Uh, yeah fair no but i think uh, huge kudos to you and the team for doing this because i think uh, as a young individual in the ecosystem i also see the need for how education can truly transform lives you don't have to necessarily wait for a life changing experience or a life changing job to do that to you mm-hmm. if education already does okay. which is not what is happening mm-hmm. and so i think what you're doing is a immense service I, and i genuinely mean that uh, but you know the problem statement in my head and i asked you this a couple of maybe a month or two back when i first mm-hmm. visited regarding scale right mm-hmm. because it almost feels like the first time i visited campus i'm like wow all the things that i see on instagram are true <laughs> they're all just you know a gimmick they they're actually learning by doing there's so much happening i remember like there was a marketing ha- hackathon happening the I first time i came yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was like everybody's doing something you told me that people we actually saw a room which we were visiting you were showing me a tour and people were sleeping there at 4 <laughs> o'clock because they were up there right uh, but uh, what i'm trying to add it is how does the scale right because as a as a, you know somebody is plugged into the startup ecosystem yeah. host venture found one yeah. founders it's like this should go to everyone as a founder i think how does this scale because you know value That's equals really scale yeah. uh, as an experience somebody who experienced this i was wondering why can this not reach to like a thousand people 10000 people right this yeah. ought to Yeah. but i remember your answer at the time and i'd love to hear your thoughts now was it does not mm. it should not i'm not building it for a, t- a 10000 people audience right but um, how do you look at this challenging challenging statement right as an ambitious person yourself yeah. i'm sure you're also thinking can i scale this to from 250 to 2500 people does that happen if yes how if not why not yeah perfect so i maintain my answer this does <laughs> not scale okay i do not intend to scale this all right my ambition is served by my ambition in a sense to become top 10 business school in the world hmm right so my ambition is not to get to 10000 students my ambition is to get to top 10 in the world hmm right and if i with this alternative methodology this alternative pedagogy am able to get to top 10 in the world then others will automatically start adopting my pedagogy and that's ah. how it will scale Really? So yeah. give you very and, and this has happened before. Twenty years ago, HBS came up with the case study method of mm. pedagogy. Yeah, HBS did well, and today all universities, all business schools across the world use the case study method. Yeah, that's how the case study method scaled. So mm. HBS doesn't have to scale. The case study method, method has, has to, to scale. scale. Yeah. Similarly, with us, Masters Union does not have to scale. Masters Union has to become the best in the world. right mm. and just yesterday we declared on economic <laughs> times that in 5 years we will be top 10 yeah right in the world and top 10 right next to harvard wharton yale stanford stern sloan lbs ncad we should be 8th or 9th yeah. right that's our proclamation that's my ambition right once that happens believe me every business school in the world we'll would be adopting this. our hands on pedagogy yeah that's lovely i'm not thought about it that way but when you put it like that i think it puts everything into perspective and starts making a lot of sense there um but this has been interesting the other aspect that i was wondering when i was you know trying to understand that when you build an education institute what can go wrong and my answer to that was stakeholder management and without putting it into fuzzy terms all i'm trying to say is that you know you have a student you have recruiters you have practitioners who are coming in as faculty yeah. mm. then you have your team mm. 
building it out right there are multiple so stakeholders business, right business. yes so and multiple stakeholders with different objectives i'm guessing right uh, the student is trying to optimize for placements for instance uh, the recruiter is trying to optimize for great quality talent the so on and so forth I, I'm, i'm sure you get the point what i'm trying to understand from you is how do you maintain almost like a mental map of trying to appease everyone and trying to ensure everyone's enabling getting enabled to achieve the objective that they set out to like how do you fulfill their objectives like what is it for a practitioner to come in spend their time here like what is the value that defined for them yeah. how do you make sure they are important enough as much as the student because i'm guessing that's an important piece of the pie right and all of this i'm referring to again going back to the point because this is not been done so you have no playbook to rely yeah. on right so it's not like you can point to somebody and be like they've done it this should be intuitive for you as well yeah. you're almost reinventing it right how do you ensure these multiple moving parts and align them into one i i think there are two answers to this question one is that the incentives are aligned right even if even if yeah. the the objectives are not the incentives are right okay so everyone wants to build good talent student wants to do it for himself or herself fair teachers want to do it for the students hmm. uh practitioners want to do it for the students recruiters want it for themselves right so in that sense the incentives are fully aligned Okay, one single horizontal incentive, which is great talent. Which is great talent, right? So okay. in that sense, the war cry is common, mm. right? You have your artillery, you have your air force, yeah. you have your everything, but the war cry is the same: go yeah. with the war, right? Go build great talent. Now, in terms of specific stakeholder management, you correctly pointed out we have four or five stakeholders, sets yeah. of stakeholders. So for students, it's about high NPS in their class and high mm. NPS for their placements. Okay, right? for my teachers it's about whether they are getting that gratification mm. right whether they are seeing the students grow mm. right and if the pedagogy is correct and the the teacher genuinely is passionate about the subject and teaching then that will happen mm. practitioners also want gratification it's super interesting that there is a human need to give back yeah there is a human need to give back yeah. let me uh, tell you even more metaphysically how this works or biologically how this works right tell me so it's super interesting uh, and i might might get some terms wrong here uh when we are kids right when we are kids uh our happiness comes from endorphins hmm. okay that's why you would see kids running around yeah they run around they're you know always sort of like hyperactive hyperactive <laughs> that's because that releases endorphins and that causes them happiness okay okay but what happens slowly is that your body becomes immune to endorphins mm right just as it becomes immune to anything right, right. It becomes immune to endorphins so in a different kind of happiness mm. right so then suddenly your happiness starts coming from dopamine yeah right so that's when you want success in life yeah. that's when you want a hot girlfriend yeah. that's when you want a hug right yeah so it's super interesting that now you are getting happiness from dopamine eventually mm. what starts happening is that your body becomes immune to dopamine also yeah right and then for women specifically their happiness starts coming from a different enzyme or a different hormone called oxytocin which is mm. released when you caress for a baby or when you care for a baby yeah. when you see a, a child grow up that is when you get oxytocin yeah right and so your happiness is dependent on your children mm. correct that happens right yeah but slowly eventually even that fades away mm -hmm. so you need happiness from something else right and i'm forgetting what comes what the name of the hormone is uh, we can probably write it yeah, below yeah. One, uh, yeah. is uh, i think it's serotonin not serotonin ox uh, one more yeah uh, that is released when you give back when you give mm. something to somebody when you give arms to the poor when you help somebody out right, right. that gives you this sense that's why after 50 55 people start doing Philanthropy. philanthropy yeah because they get that happiness from it wow. so when we go to practitioners and ask them to come and teach i mean no one ever has said no to me even the busiest of people like being bcg partners they don't say no to me hmm. they said of course we'll come and teach can we just do it on a sunday yeah. <laughs> right and and us and we make that happen <coughs> so uh, you know i mean so that yeah. helps stakeholder management this is slightly more convoluted <laughs> answer love, to your question no i love that i think that's that's a very different perspective to how i've always imagined it i've seen this in action and i think it's more relevant in the startup ecosystem where it's almost 
insane and almost unbelievable how much people want to help or yeah. give back right it is incredible and i think uh, i i agree to the point but i didn't know the science behind it so thanks for that <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually very everything can be boiled down to uh, these four or five hormones <coughs> yeah the human behavior is about these four or five hormones yeah um but who are the other stakeholders right so parents are a very important stakeholder yeah. right parents want their kids to be taken <coughs> care of they yeah. don't care if their kids make a lot of money they yeah. want to make sure their kids are happy safety safety security right so you yeah. have to sort of cater to that so we have um a, a newsletter that goes out to parents you know just talking about hey listen oh. and they, we don't talk about placements too much and all that wow. stuff just talk about hey just everything's fine happy, safe smiles, yeah. all of that right um, <laughs> things are just safe yeah safe, yeah No, I think that's super cool. Do you have a mental model or clear objectives to address this, or this is a low-hanging fruit where things happen by chance? Like, because I remember, so this comes from this. Brian Chesky talks about this a lot, right? Where Airbnb has clearly defined stakeholders, objectives for each of them, and almost metrics that align you to serve each of them perfectly well. Yeah. I I've seen this become a low hanging fruit in organizations because it feels intuitive yeah. because it feels like it falls into place anyway, anyway but when you do it with system with the process I think it exponentially increases the experience so for us it's different see okay. the mapping of customer journey mm-hmm. and making sure there's a delight moment at every customer journey is what Brian Chexy talked about right yeah, yeah so I think that's something you have to do when you're operating at scale hmm right I have a 1 is to 7 student to teacher ratio yeah which is massive in comparison to the right. world or india right in fact as it stands today yeah i have more people in my team than i have students at least in my pgp program oh, right yeah right it's super interesting yeah so i have no reason <coughs> to not give each student dedicated time attention dedicated attention i don't want yeah. this to scale hmm teaching people effectively I strongly believe mentoring people effectively I strongly believe does not scale. Right? Yeah. So we should quit doing that. Right? Yeah. And so that's why we have established that we are not going to have more than 240 students in our MBA program and mm-hmm. never more than 500 students in each year for our undergraduate program. Yeah. We're not going to happen. Not going to happen. And each student is mapped with a mentor. Each mm-hmm. student is mapped with a teacher within the masters union campus each student is mapped with uh, a placement mentor and it's their job to give each student individual attention um, and cater to his or her needs right yeah. not we don't have to scale yeah that's brilliant i think um, that again it it makes it, everything starts to make sense when you put it like that but i think from the outside it seems like okay why are these parts how do you figure these parts I think as we you know come to a couple of you know concluding questions I'd love to understand from you if you can maybe paint a picture for us uh in terms of let's say how does a student look when they enter the campus vis-a-vis what they are like when they exit and you were talking about yeah. the gratification piece of it and, and you of course published results for placements yeah. but let's put those so, numbers yeah. aside once right I just want to understand on a more human level what they look like i mean that exponential what growth is what is the delta yes i mean what does that look like the delta and we actually measure this okay oh interesting um, is is in four ways right first delta is how they articulate right brilliant uh, how they articulate that's it so if you ask someone a question yeah. before they start their master's union experience they will probably answer in 300 words Right mm-hmm. that same question if you ask them after the master union experience they should be able to answer it in 30 words brilliant i so, love that you mentioned that i think articulation goes again is one of those things that's so natural that people don't talk about it but it's so crucial right can you yeah second is saying yes right okay tell me more so yeah this is super interesting you know most of our students come with work experience mm-hmm. right and a lot of the times you know we notice that if we present students with problems they have this tendency of saying oh this is too problematic let's move on hmm they don't have a solutions mindset they say no a lot yeah right so if their boss were to come and say hey listen you know let's do this xyz they automatically look for reasons to say no hmm. they look for reasons to why is that is it more like a comfort mindset no i think i think it's 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 just that our education system at the primary secondary high school level has mm. told people to always confirm 
yeah to, to to believe and not question, not question. Is, i'm borrowing this from you itself yeah <laughs> so so because of that people don't question people don't question about how this yeah. could have been done differently anyway so they say no a lot yeah right uh what we try to figure out is that in this one year we give them a diverse set of experiences that makes them say yes that makes them yeah. uh look for solutions rather than excuses yeah right and the way we measure this is super interesting so uh you know in an interview setting so we do an in- entry interview and an exit interview okay right in an entry interview we always ask them this question you know what are some of the problems that you've been able to solve in life that you're super proud of mm. right and the answers are very 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 tired answers right yeah. like they're basic. not inspiring they're yeah. not inspiring. the oh, basic you know ones like um you know my mom needed some help with something and i yeah. like, right they don't have answers stories where yeah. they have solved problems mm. we do an exit interview where we ask them the same question right yeah. what are some of the problems that you have solved now suddenly they have five or six problems that they talk about right amazing as part of one of the experiences that they had in college yeah right and that problem solving mindset we see it grows while you are here right yeah. so first is articulation second is problem solving right or saying yes we call it saying yes in our internal matrix system third is hustle mm right which is the intensity with which you work okay okay and this is something we test for when students come in when they come in we actually ask them to do a video as part of their application process all right, right? but it's an optional video mm right only 20% of the applicants actually do it do it right automatically for me they are hustlers they did something mm-hmm. that was not required, required of them yeah right so whoever is watching this and if you are applying <laughs> to the video right <laughs> this is your secret this hack is your secret right now number one number two there are some people who would go above and beyond we also give a sample video mm. that you know this is what the video should look like mm-hmm. and again out of those 20% 18% people would basically just make a different version of that same video mm but 2% 2% would you know completely outdo that video like they would do yeah. something even more crazy yeah that to me is hustle right mm. now through the program they have a lot of submissions mm. they have a lot of businesses they have to start right and by the end of it we do see this change happening where people start hustling a lot more yeah right so if you were to give them an optional question at the end of the year yeah i promise you the people who answer it would be 50% yeah because they've understood that you have to go the extra mile you have to go out of your way right yeah so that hustle that going the extra mile is something we measure we really think about a lot right yeah and finally the fourth thing is collaboration right mm. which is a factor of a few things which is listening to somebody you know really understanding them empathy all of those things that we spoke about right yeah so by the virtue of being brought up in an indian society we are even though in a famili- family setup very collectivist mm-hmm. in a work setup we are very individualistic mera yeah. kaam yeah. mera target yeah the pronouns we use ha wo hai right correct in the family it's always about hum <laughs> yeah at work it's always about me me we'll often have people who are presenting ideas to us in a team and mm. then they would say you know my idea yeah my solution mhm there are four other people standing <laughs> on the stage right and they beside. completely ignore that yeah. right what happens through the year at masters union is that all your assignments mhm all your projects are done in groups right and they are hard assignments yeah. and you have to depend on each other yeah right number one number two we also try to design our projects in such a way that you have to depend on other people unless that person does his job or her job you will not be able to start your job mm-hmm. right so there is some sort of designing we do in that so all of that creates this environment where people become better collaborators yeah right so at the end of the year we also try to check for um oh yeah so the main thing that we do is we do peer scoring yeah interesting right yeah. so every every assignment will have maybe 80% score that is given by an outside authority external external but 20% is always going to be peer grading 
Right? Awesome. And what that does, it makes you be nice to people. Yeah. Right. It makes you. You're incentivized. You're incentivized. To be nice. Yeah. And then slowly it becomes habit. Yeah. yeah. Right. I can imagine. So these are the four or five things, softer things that we see people grow into, you know, in, in the one year that they're here. And we are very, very deliberate about these things. Yeah. We have not left this to chance. Yeah. Which most colleges have. So exactly. Learning is also a science. Yeah. Education is also a science. People yeah. just don't look at it that way. Yeah. Right? But we have these matrix matrices and um, we try to sort of do it as much as possible. But I would tell you this, that we haven't achieved it like 10 on 10 yet. We are probably six on 10 in terms yeah. of the, the rigor of this particular matrix and assessment. And always a work in progress, but I absolutely love that because I think that just goes to show the thought that gets put into designing an experience for an individual who comes into master's union and then having it evaluated on that basis as well. Not just like saying things that you don't mean, you know, things like walk the talk and stuff like that. I think that just proves it. And I think that's very, very helpful. I think, uh, you know, as we conclude, I have like a series of similar questions that okay. I ask most founders. And this is more on your personal mm. side, right? Uh, one of the things that I often wonder is how do founders sort of go about the trajectory of absorbing, of, you know, initiating new conversations, of absorbing new knowledge, and then recreating as well. Because so much of what founders do is radically very different, right? And there are new challenges. And you have to be up to date, you have to absorb, you have to reflect, and then you have to act as well. Is there anything that you face a particular challenge with? Or how do you think of this as a problem statement, right? In your personal life? Yeah. Uh, how do you upskill for the lack of a, if I had to summarize, right? Because you are not just absorbing, you're also doing and you're reflecting as well. Yeah. What's, your, what's your mantra? Um, I think for me, it's about talking to other founders. Hmm. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, I've heard that before. Yeah. Tell us why. I think like there is a founder mindset. Hmm. Um, and founders only relate to other founders. Yeah. They're, they're extroverted, so they will talk to everybody. <laughs> yeah. Right. They'll talk to everybody. They'll engage everybody. Yeah. But that beer is relate with... to founders, yeah. other founders. Right. And so I've often tried to be part of as many founder groups as I can, hmm. where people are vulnerable. Right. Founders hmm. will never be vulnerable in public. Yeah. Right. So for me, there is this concept called the forum, uh, which is very cool, actually. I don't know if you've heard of it. There's an organization in Delhi called YPO. Okay. Young President's Organization. Mm -hmm. And as part of YPO, uh, which has around 100 members in Delhi, um, 100, 150 members, you're also part of a forum. And a forum only has mm -hmm. 10 members. And that forum is usually constituted of other founders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, in that forum, you have complete non-disclosure. Right? So that means you can share anything in that forum. It will and never, never go, go out. out. You actually sign it with your blood. Oh, wow. Right? Number one. Number two, you commit to 100% vulnerability. Mm. Okay. And you can do that because there is a non-disclosure. Yeah. Right. So I have been able to share my deepest, darkest desires, secrets, vulnerabilities in that group. And mm. I have been able to get opinions on that. I've yeah. been able to understand what other people's experiences are in similar settings. Right. Yeah. Um, if like I'm breaking up with my co-founder, let's say. Right? Yeah. I don't have one, but so that's why it's, it's <laughs> hypothetical. Yeah. I cannot talk about this to public. I cannot even yep. talk about this to my mother because she probably will not understand yep. right, what I'm going through. I can't talk to my spouse about it because, you know, she again might be coming from a very different background. Mm. I can only talk to other founders. So this yeah. forum brings in people very like-minded and yeah. gives them a very safe space to be open. Yeah. Right? So I really recommend, uh, and by the way, my biggest source of growth is this forum. Wow. Is this like a secret society or is it out no, there? No, it's there. I mean, YPO.com. <laughs> yeah. Just please nah, go there. I had no idea, yeah. but I think this is so required because I've heard this from so many founders on the show that we just relate to founders. We want to talk to peer folks, preferably folks who've been there, done that sort of a thing. So no, that we can get... And also, uh, none of those 10 people can be competitors. Yeah. That too. So they won't be so the that, same yeah, industry. Yeah, exactly. There's so no in my one, there's no one from education. Hmm. So there's somebody from... Auto, there are two people from automobile, like two different automobile. <laughs> like one is a dealer and one is a, uh, you know, manufacturer. Mm -hmm. uh, another one who comes from HR background. Another one who comes from uh, the services background. Another one yeah. who runs a hotel. Another <laughs> one who runs, you know, large tech company. Yeah. So it's 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 so diverse. I mean, like, I'm I'm so glad you asked this question. Yeah. And even if you can't join YPO, mm -hmm. 
try to build a group of five or six founders yeah. and, and sort of make vulnerability mm-hmm. the central tenet of that group. Yeah. I've also heard folks say that, you know, you need these peer founders or people that you're like, looking, if not looking up to, you're just like learning from them on the mentors, fly yeah. and condensing time, right? Yeah, could be mentors, but do you have people that, you know, you surround yourself very consciously to, you know, actively up, upskill yourself? I think it's a forum. I mean, it comes back it's to the forum. forum. I mean, thankfully in my forum, everyone's much older than me. Nice. And, and because of that, they bring in experiences that are super cool, you know, yeah. super deep. Um, and, and the forum gives them a safe space to share, right? Got it. Uh, that's the important part, right? Like even if you have a mentor, even mm-hmm. if you have a group of founders who meet every weekend and yeah. drink together, let's say, or even if you are part of the same portfolio of let's say Sequoia or Axel or whatever, right? Yeah. And you have these learning events where you go <laughs> retreats and you learn yeah. from each other. You can have tactical learnings, hmm. right? You can but, have strategic learnings, hmm. but to grow as a founder, you need to be vulnerable. You need in to the be moment. vulnerable. You need yeah. to first voice out your vulnerabilities. Yeah, I jammed up in this. Yeah, yeah. a founder cannot go on your story or <laughs> you know on on on, on this podcast, or yeah, on podcast and admit to all the mistakes they have made. Correct. Right, they have stakeholders. They, I mean, I'll only only say good things about <laughs> uh, and and a few bad things that have no yeah, bearing yeah. anymore. If Absolutely. I'm struggling with something today, I'll never tell you. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really nice to hear. I think that's, I didn't know about that forum. So that's great for founders who are listening and also to know that, you know, how you absorb your energy. Uh, the other aspect, and, you know, I, I keep wondering about this, about founders, is that you almost, like, the tribe, it pulls off different hats like it's nothing, right? And for you as well, I think you're wearing multiple hats as the founder of Masters Union. You'll also, of course, like, you know, have family. So you travel often, from what I know. So you have to engage time there. At Masters Union, you're, you know, the director of all things that's happening, building a team, actively recruiting, posting content, whatnot, right? There's a wide ambit of things that you have to inevitably do. How do you embrace this challenge, almost thrive on it? Yeah. A- and again, I-, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a depth versus breadth problem, but is this ever, has this ever been an obstruction to your functioning or have you ever felt like I'm doing too much? Uh, how do you navigate this challenge? I-, I think the gratification takes care of most of the <laughs> challenges, right? right? It's just so gratifying. The result is so. The result is so good that you don't even mm, think about it, right? Fair. Um, that's one. But the other thing is that I think you need a supportive family. Hmm. Um, yeah. Like, you know, my parents understand um, that I'm busy uh, with mm-hmm. work. So, you know, they're very sensitive about calling me at certain times. Mm. And even if I don't show up at home one weekend, you know, they'll not make a big deal about it. They'll yeah. in fact support me. <laughs> yeah. You know, my mom will send me food. Right? All of those things mm-hmm. uh, really help you. So I think a supportive family is everything at the end of the day. I think nothing else more than that it. substitutes that. Um, but I also maintain all my tasks mm-hmm. in my WhatsApp to myself. So I have a WhatsApp yes, group. Everybody has that group. Yeah. Yes. What's it called? Internal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My my one is called literally myself. Okay. Yeah. That's a good I one. hope nobody's judging. That's, that's yeah. a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> so there, all my so if, as soon as I write something down, hmm. it's not cluttering my head anymore. Yeah. And I feel like since I started doing that, it's been my superpower. Earlier I used to do this on Evernote. Yeah. But Evernote is not as quick to register your thoughts on. Yeah. It, you have to open it, it loads, all of that. Yeah. It doesn't happen, right? Bad anyways, on WhatsApp, yeah. so you just do it, right? Yeah. Uh, now, in that group, I'm going to add my founder's office person. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and now it's me. It'll be yeah. with, yeah. with so him. Yeah. The other thing is that I think everyone should have a founder's office Yeah. Team. And build it off entrepreneurs. Like, how do you build it off? Could be entrepreneurs, could be people who work hard, could be people who can match your energy. Yeah. Um, that's about it. But you should have it because it really makes you 3x yeah. in terms of your effectiveness, right. efficacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, since I have, I have two, three people in my team and, and you know, like sometimes I can just tell them an idea and then they will make sure that gets executed with the relevant team. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, so for example, on Monday, I'm going for a wedding for three days, mm-hmm. literally a day after. We're going to yeah. go out for a wedding. Nice. Right? And, and while I'm super excited for this wedding because it's a close family member's wedding, I'm also thinking how the work will happen. Right? Super concerned. Super There's something con- on your mind always. Exactly. So what I've done is I've just called my founders of his team and I've told them for the next three days, these are my priorities. Hmm. Right. Just can you just please take care of it. Right. Hmm. Um, and, and they have that much say in the company that, they that can. people 
take their word as my word mm. and and they almost replace me if i'm not there for 5 6 days i think so yeah. that's something that's super useful yeah as well and that's that's interesting to know because i've also realized that you're super approachable like i mean we are in one or two groups and you know we chat mm-hmm. sometimes and i almost receive a reply from you instantly like in a couple of hours if not earlier right and i think that's massively difficult to manage but it's amazing how you pull it off and it's great to know how you are you know just building out this entire piece and skilling yourself so it's very interesting just to on that i also have all of my 164 students on my whatsapp they can oh. message me at any time yeah and if they are listening to this and i'm very happy to to say it out loud like they will all get a response with me within 1 to 2 hours yeah if they message before 2 am at night <laughs> they will get it they know yeah. that right and 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 uh, that's also the case with all of my team members mm. told them like every message comes is secondary to the students message yeah like they are the most important the students on priority one that, yeah that's uh, and that comes back to like this not scaling <laughs> uh, yes no but i think it's interesting for you know uh, i i have two more questions for them what i would love to know before we close down is we've spoken about scale for you know let's say the growth mindset for the students we've spoken about how masters union as a model does not have to scale the process has to talk to us about how your scaling journey has been right as an individual and i mean more on the qualitative side mm. on the quantitative side you know you've done a bunch of things of course but beyond the you know tangible metrics i'd love to know what were things that you were absolutely unaware of that you now know with all your years of wisdom because you know you had we started off with these notes right yeah. like when we we discussed yeah. learnings for you yeah. but now with you know having built a saas company yeah. now on to education doing multiple yeah. things i think wisdom comes from reflection hmm so a lot of people have a lot of experiences yeah but you really have to pause and reflect to learn from your experiences exactly i think sometimes you're in this grind of next target hmm. next this next that that we forget to reflect yeah and i am and i've learned from my mistakes on this i i, I don't think i reflected for 6 7 years as mm. i was building out grow hmm. right and all the learnings that i was having were ephemeral right there were learnings that i would yeah. have sure but never get to apply because they haven't assimilated in my fabric as Correct. an individual they're not part of your system they're not part of my system yet mm. i might speak them out loud in a podcast yeah but they're not part of my system yet yeah so and reflection is super important where you take a break mm. you sometimes write it down or mentally take notes of what happened today yeah or last week or last year mm. and tell yourself okay what will i do differently so right. this is a deliberate part of your process now um uh, i'm trying to make it more so it's not yet also as as structured but i'd like it to be more structured where i say after 6 days or one week or two, <coughs> two weeks or two months or whatever i take some time off to just structure mm. to to reflect sorry and so sometimes that happens like on the go like i'm in a flight and my phone yeah. is not working and then i'll <laughs> reflect right it sometimes happens when i'm on a holiday right it yeah. sometimes happens um you know so those i think reflection is 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 very underrated is very key is very underrated yeah um, underrated i think some people journal yeah i think that's a great way to reflect yeah because you're forced to think about you know your learnings but i think like maybe less than 0.01% people actually do it yeah in any justified way so yeah what about you i'm also i mean the single most learning for me also through the podcast has been the best founders are actually very very self aware mm. self awareness usually comes from a lot of reflection yeah, to action right. because otherwise most things get attributed to luck or a lack of a process but winning consistently is what founders do best mm-hmm. and in my opinion that usually comes from a very safe space of being very inward focused and being self aware and that is a result of how well you can reflect reflect right for me i i i also wouldn't say i think it's very uncomfortable because when you're a sense of flow it almost feels like let's keep doing right yeah. because it gives you a sense of gratification because there's an output yeah. but uh, it's not sustainable because you don't even if you're winning you're not winning in a way that you can replicate yeah. which almost defeats the purpose right mm. which is why i think it's amazing how you mentioned that uh, but i think being more thoughtful and yeah. deliberate about it is super crucial i mean we do appraisals for all of our team members mm-hmm. but founders don't do their own appraisals yeah exactly and, and they don't like get feedback also right yeah. like we're not enough 
like how many times does somebody actively question you even in the most liberal teams i feel that will always be lacking because you are coming from a point of view that's very different and even if somebody has they'll probably give you the benefit of the doubt because they don't have full context right so i feel it's very difficult so i think the best founders on my show have mentioned this in a different way or form mm-hmm. you mentioned it in a different way uh, for me i think i've also realized the importance of it and the more i go through this i try to be like long term focused and i take pauses very often now mm. i mean in the sense just like stopping to not reflect in like in a journal way but just think through my actions in a more deliberate manner like why am i doing something to begin with right is it just because i'm in a sense of flow that helps me be continue that and it feels good because i don't want to be uncomfortable because stopping is damn difficult right especially when you're in a up cycle right yeah. you're, you're just riding the yeah. wave you're doing so well you just don't have time exactly and i mean time, it feels like a it feels like a pause uh, to growth but i feel in the larger scheme of things those like that one day uh, in like 30 days is not a pause to growth it's mm-hmm. mostly like a it's a it's, it's a, a huge benefit in the 30 year cycle accelerator in fact yes so i think yeah for Land me price. it's a, it's more around just taking brief pauses and being okay with setting your own pace mm-hmm. but um, yes i think this has been fantastic uh, as we conclude right and this is also something which would which might come across as stereotypical pratham but i'd love to hear your honest thoughts you just spoke that you know is very the importance of vulnerability you just accepted it out loud to end if you can maybe just share with us not in a traditional way mm. but in the more proactive way the challenges that you've probably faced because very often and i think it's a personal mission for me to not make this podcast make a starting up sexy yeah. i don't think it is mm. it's not glamorous yeah. and because you're on that side it feels very aspirational for somebody listening to be yeah. but i don't ever want that to be the message so if you can maybe just end with challenges that you face mm-hmm. and the core motivation that makes you do the abnormal for the lack of a better word yeah. things as a founder that you do right like founders will get up at like 5 o'clock sleep at like 12 a.m mm-hmm. and like just like be full energy throughout the day reply in one two hours yeah. what not so challenges core motivation to build masters union that be a fitting end so let's start with the core motivation that's an easy let's one let's do it um which is i think education is a problem worth solving yeah and it is the problem if solved it solves 100 other problems yeah like poverty like shortage of food you know yes. it's sort of the mother of all problems yeah uh, so i think i think motivation there is is just very very clear right um on the challenges front and you know let's try to be vulnerable <laughs> on this right um first is time for family mm. right i i i recently watched this movie uh called goodbye i don't know if you've seen it i know my sister was recommending yeah, it yeah you should watch yeah. it um and there the kids uh, the, the mother passes away mm. right and the kids are reflecting on how they did not spend enough time with her and now they're just mm. yearning for like one more minute you know mm. if i could just be with her right if yeah. i could have just responded to her last call if i could have just messaged her back So one thing that I struggle with is you know like this thought of am I spending enough time with my family and will not spending enough time with them come back to bite me later in life right yeah. most of the times when you ask people what's your biggest regret it's going to be I did not spend enough time with my family yeah. parents whatever right yeah and and I feel like I'm on that path where it'll be similar for me right mm. and and that to me is honestly like very scary very scary right so i try as much as possible to take the last flight out or the first flight in to make sure i can spend some time with them mm-hmm. but still it's not enough okay yeah. right so it, it's it's a constant struggle for me because it, the work demands me to be here yeah my parents are in a different city hmm. um i take maybe four flights five flights a week right and still it's not enough hmm. right i watched that movie and i felt so guilty right? yeah so that's that's something that you know it really bothers me you know work will go up and down but family is a constant right like that so you have yeah. to give it enough importance and i'm not able to that's one other another vulnerability is that yeah um just like this fear of failure mm. right you have described me in so many good <laughs> superlatives yeah now i have to live up to it mm. so there is this constant fear of what if i am not able to mm. right then I would like you know मेरे को आपने चढ़ा दिया ऊपर मैं गिरूंगा तो बहुत बुरा गिरूंगा type yeah so 
that is something that does not let me sleep at night that you know there's a lot of expectations riding on me from my team from my students yeah and if placements don't go well this year mm. if the campus is not ready on time yeah. if i say something stupid on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> yeah. what happens then yeah like, have you have you failed before yeah, yeah all the time mm-hmm. all the time and sometimes it's been all right because i've learned and i've sort of come out of it sometimes it's been sometimes it's caused me to lose some of my team members let's say mm-hmm. right sometimes it's caused me to have bad relationships with some of my senior team members yeah right sometimes i've lost my cool yeah right so uh, publicly very Right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I've taken super wrong decisions. Right. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> it's something very s- small that, like, you know, I try to, I, I force my opinion on my team that, hey, listen, we need to have this yellow branding. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I told them, no, carpet also yellow. <laughs> Now the carpet yeah. is fully stained. <laughs> Now I know who's responsible for yeah, this. <laughs> it's, 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 they kept telling me, no, don't do it. You know, like, let's yeah. not the walls, maybe, but not on the carpet. Like, no, uh, no, small failure. Mm-hmm. All the way to some larger ones as well, where I. you know took certain calls to you know recruit certain students or recruit certain faculty that weren't very good fits yeah and that created huge issues uh with our brand or whatever right so yeah uh you you fail a lot but but when like it's it still i mean those smaller failures are still okay yeah. but the larger failure of like what if yeah, now yeah. i've proclaimed top 10 in the world what if not it does not happen <laughs> it does not happen yeah my credibility is fully lost <laughs> yeah i think there's some science to how a little amount of fear is actually good for performance yeah. and i think productive anxiety yeah I, i'm not sure what it's called so i'll probably refrain from that but i think uh, there was this very interesting i'm forgetting the name uh, of the person but the sequoia uh, us you know, the global md right he talks about this in his talk that he's afraid he'll lose his job mm. this is at a stanford talk uh, and he's mentioning this dug uh, yeah he he's mentioning this and it's the first time that i thought to myself this is a very radically different thought right where fear can actually be used as a motivator for action and yeah. that's 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 nice it's it's not i don't think it's i think it can make you do certain things that mm-hmm. are not good right if fear mm-hmm. is the main motivator yeah it can't be the primary one it for sure it can't be the primary yeah. Yeah, yeah it could be a supporting one yeah, but it, it should not overbear absolutely you would then you would try to cut corners yeah because then you're making decisions out of fear which never works which is not good yeah, yeah. so that's uh, but i see the value of it i think yeah. there is a certain value but it has to be balanced yeah yeah Super cool questions, man. This is uh, I haven't reflected in a while. I feel like this podcast was my large reflection. A lot of the answers I gave you, yeah. I don't think I knew about them. Like no, that's that. nice. I mean, my north star metric as a podcast host is to ensure: can I make the guest on my other side think out loud? Yeah. And if they're thinking for the first time, I think I'd have done yeah, a good no, job. Absolutely. It no, also but, comes out in the pace of your speech. So I realize mm. today I'm speaking very, very slowly. <laughs> This because I'm yeah. thinking you're and thinking and speaking yeah much of hosting a podcast or being a part of it is actually just processing and expressing at meteoric speeds that most people don't really think out loud about yeah. like i mean that's that but no this has been amazing so we end with those two massive ones i mean i must uh, commend the fact that you were completely candid there i think both of those pointers are really food for thought for a choice of life that founders you know go ahead with mm-hmm. which is trade off with family time mm-hmm. or just like you know the fear of expectations responsibility for some it's millions of consumers for some it's lack of spending time at home because they're at office and the way you put it was really nice thank you so much prasam no, for absolutely. this conversation i think this was massively a uh, valuable i have certainly learned so much uh, by virtue of just knowing more about how you do certain things what the difference in education needs to be and your process to it so super thanks to thanks you so and i hope no. you had a good time i did i did thanks for listening to this me this was wonderful thank you so much pratham